Hello and welcome to History 391. I'm going to talk briefly today about um, this idea of, of what happens to the servicemen or perception of American servicemen who go to fight in Vietnam. There is a kind of a long-standing and long-held belief that, um, you know, that American soldiers came back to be spat upon and treated very badly by their neighbours back in the US. And there are many reasons to kind of question this kind of dominant narrative. Um, for one thing, we know for a fact that many veterans came back to their communities and were welcomed um, and were honoured. I mean, for example, here in Danville, Kentucky, you can go to the court building here in town. And when you come back, you can do that. And you will see right there beside the World War II veterans, we have the Vietnam War veterans, um, you know, people who went and men who went and served in that war. Um, at the same time, there were uh, examples of troops who came home who were treated very poorly, which is something that had not been had not happened before, um, really, at least not certainly in living memory. Certainly, you compared very bad with World War II. World War II, of course, which is different because America won World War II, saw troops coming back to you know massive um, celebration and um, and heralding, really, you know, and 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 kind of being seen as champions of of democracy and civilization and defenders of the meek and the weak and everything else. Um, it was different uh, it, with Vietnam and certainly although there were troops who came back to be welcomed by the local communities, even some of the more positive welcomes tended to be kind of muted or at least this is what we understand from testimony from the time. And so it, it, it was a very challenging thing, I think, for many Americans to kind of process and to kind of figure out. And I, I think that you have the more proximate issue of World War II. And of course, many of these veterans' fathers had served in World War II. And the comparison between the World War II reaction and the Vietnam War reaction was, was, was really very significant. When you, I think you also have this deeper self-questioning concern about what this means for um, the United States and, and, and what this means for American conceptions of identity and you know respect for the troops and everything else. Um, you and I live in an America where there is this consistent, overt um, support for the military, the thank you for your service kind of culture idea, um, which is, is, it's not that it's relatively new in American society, these things tend to ebb and flow, but certainly this was not as common a thing to happen um, in everyday life in the United States in, for example, the 1960s and 1970s. The, you know, the, the thank you for your service kind of culture, the presence of the military, like NFL games and all these kinds of ideas, these are all things that have kind of ramped up in the last 30 years. Not that they're bad or anything, anything like uh, anything of the sort, but just that, you know, our culture is practicing this in a slightly different way. At the same time then, so we have this issue and there's a genuine um, empirical problem of establishing how many, you know, or, or what percentage of troops are coming back to negative reactions and everything else. The public perception, and I feel like I'm saying this in these videos a lot now because it's, it's, it's consistently true. The public perception becomes, or the popular narrative becomes, or the memor memorializing narrative in the years that follow becomes, our troops came home and they were spat upon and treated badly. And that in and of itself is important. That's kind of a flawed narrative. It's not necessarily the case. But the fact that it became the narrative is important and I think is worth noting. And it ties into our understanding of the war as a whole. And also, I think that many Americans would point out and would be right to point out, the issue isn't so much was every single soldier who came home treated badly or were a majority of them treated badly, but the fact that any of them were treated badly or the, fa the fact that more than one or two had some kind of a negative experience uh, is, is a problem and is a major problem in American culture. Now. The other side of it as well is that demoralization is already happening among American troops in Vietnam. Um, many of them want to come home. When they do come home, they don't want to talk about it. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder is a huge problem um, with uh, soldiers who served in Vietnam, but was not something that was discussed anywhere near as widely or openly in the 1970s as it is today. And of course, beyond the mental trauma, the psychological trauma, you have the very real physical trauma of um, particularly injured um, veterans coming home. And these things are all very complex. And um, it's tough in the United States on a broader kind of angle of how to kind of manage this transformation. So um, there's two there's two links I put attached for the reading for this video today. One of them is the Ballad of the Green Beret, which is this song in 1966. And um, I have a YouTube clip that you guys should watch that is this extraordinarily, you know, straight-laced, um, you know, man in a Marine, you know, a Marine 
he was a Marine, uh, in his uniform singing this song. And it's very kind of, ho-ho, here we go. You know, this is, we support the, the Green Beret, you know, who were the ultimate fighting force. And there's this kind of, and that's part of it. There's this fetishization of the ultimate fighting force and the military. And these are our, these are our, um, these are the best we've got and everything else going over to defend us. That song was released in 1966. Um, it shows, you know, 68, 69, 70 are these crucial kind of turning points in how these kind of broader aspects are being discussed. I also have a link attached um, uh, the Ballad of Ho Chi Minh, which is a different ballad entirely. Now, I, I, I should stress, the Ballad of Ho Chi Minh was not something that... Um, it did not get massive popular support across the country at all. There's a certain type of anti-war activist who celebrates this. And one of the fascinating elements you have is that the anti-war movement becomes convinced, or at least certain elements of it become convinced, that Ho Chi Minh was simply fighting for the freedom of his country, that he sought independence, that he was um, fighting against imperialism, and that the Americans were the imperialists. There, are, there is enough truth in this for it to be a major problem. And this is one of the reasons that American morale begins to collapse even among American troops already in the United States. It's also deeply flawed. It completely overlooks the fact that Ho Chi Minh had the blood of thousands on his hands. It completely overlooks the fact that um, seeing Ho Chi Minh as a freedom fighter, fighting a foreign foe, is a gross oversimplification. It overlooks the fact that it is in fact parroting and replicating the propaganda of, of a communist movement in Vietnam. Um, so morally, there's lots of issues with it. But again, you know, it's all about the story that ends up being told. So the Ballad of Ho Chi Minh and people who are kind of throwing that song around and everything else and recording it and playing it, that's an example of kind of a far left radical kind of anti-war kind of perception of what's going on. But it's also reflective of kind of where the conversation has shifted towards. And there does seem to have been, there was a shift in American public opinion in enough Americans' minds to decide that the war was not just being lost, but the war was morally wrong. And this was a very big problem for many Americans to, to face, um, for any, any society to face. But the United States, um, which of course was prosecuted in the Cold War, as we've seen, um, against this you know, very clear ideological um, framework of freedom and democracy and civil rights and everything else and fighting against communism because communism restricts these rights and we support these rights. To see your own military caste as imperialists and to believe at least some of that was a difficult thing. And to be a true, be, to be a soldier um, or a marine or a sailor who maybe looked in the mirror one morning and thought, you know, I'm part of this broader kind of thing. John Kerry, for example, who mentioned the last video, comes to this conclusion. I have, I, I have been co-opted into, um, into an imperialist action. And there's also the added kind of complexity of the guys who wake up in the morning and they just don't want to be there anymore for, frankly, entirely understandable human reasons. And so there's this really interesting knock-on effect where if there's a loss of faith in enough kind of steps in the process down to your average soldier, sailor, and marine, that um, uh, it's hard to keep up morale. And once you can't keep up morale, the war is basically over. And, and this is American morale in, 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 in Vietnam collapses in the 1970s. And when those men come home, it doesn't get much better. So the transformation is really kind of is fascinating. So for the discussion question today, I want you to look at the, the shift in kind of perceptions, at least among enough Americans, um, of the American military between the 1960s and 1970s um, and discuss it in this kind of broader context of American foreign policy and perception of the military. So I'll put that a bit more concisely. Um, how do popular perceptions of the American military change from 1965 to 1975 and elaborate on why that change is important and what, what the deal is with that? Okay, thanks for watching.